welcome to week four of the Bloomerang Start to Finish uh, project for National Quilt Month. I'm Misty Doan and I'm joined here by Liz Gubernatis, Hello. our voice behind the camera, helping answer all of your questions and providing her great expertise sometimes as well. So sometimes. she's she's joining <laughs> us often. Often. Well, <laughs> yes. this part is one of my favorites. Exactly. So free motion quilting on the home machine. And it's not as scary as it sounds. And I love this size of project to get started. So. I, I think this feels really approachable, yeah. which I think is a great first step. I, I told Liz, I've taken a class, but it still is a little scary for me. So I'm excited to learn more from you yep. and have you uh, take the reins on this one. It's going to be really fun. So you can see here, if you're just joining us, we have literally sewn this start to finish uh, every Monday through the month of March. And so this is where we're at. We've, we've finished this whole uh, quilt top, I guess, yep. for our small project and it's ready to go. And so now we can create a quilt sandwich and get this ready to quilt. And, and so one of the things that I do before I even take it that far, because okay. I want it, once I get it sandwiched, I want to just sew. You're ready to start. So I want to pick my thread now so I can get my machine oh, all Oh, that's a great up. tip. Okay. Okay. So, so one of the things we that. do is, is we call it auditioning the thread. So the way you do it is you'll spool off a little bit and just kind of lay it across the project. Okay. And so while this black would blend into the background really well, it's going to show up on just about yeah, everything. it's really going to stand up, kind of yeah. look like you drew all over it. <laughs> exactly. And while that look can be awesome, and if that's your jam, go for it. The thing is, most of us tend to like to do something that blends in a little bit more, and it's okay if it stands out on the background a bit. Yeah. So I picked several colors. This yellow blends in really nicely here, but it actually stood out more than I expected it does, in yeah. some of those areas. So I thought, mm, maybe the green because of the way this color works. So I pulled a little bit of thread from all the colors. Again, it blends in nicely here, blends in pretty well here. It stands out pretty good in the flower. Yeah, it really does. Not loving it. No. So then I went, okay, well the flower is pink and purple. Let me start with a light purple. Light colors do blend really well, so that's why I started with our lighter colors. But again, because of the, the deep, rich colors that we're using in the center, that actually doesn't blend as well as I thought it would. Yeah. So this is why we audition colors, because it's, it's not always going to look the way you think. So I thought, okay, fine, be that way. I'm going <laughs> to use this bright pink that we used to stitch down our applique and see what that looks like. But I wasn't loving how much that stood out. So much contrast, yeah. In everything else. So one more try, and this is where I landed and where I'm going to use today. And this is a color called Salmon. And I'm going to pull this out here. And this one surprised me. It blended in a knife, a nicely enough to the pink. Yeah, and the it is, purple. It is going to stand out in the black, but almost everything will. But it also blended into the yellow more than I thought. It really does. And so it kind of allows the design of the piecing mm -hmm. to still be the star. Yeah. So you can nice. see on the finished one. That's what we went with. That's what we went with. That looks really good. And it does stand out on the black, but just about everything is going to. Exactly, but I, I think it almost creates the look as if the design on the black is part of the fabric yeah. instead of taking away from this beautiful design that we've worked so hard to piece together. And so it really works nicely together. I think it's a beautiful choice. And then the other thing before we jump into is I've decided to do one motif all over. So sometimes this is called edge to edge if it's on a, a big long arm um, where you just kind of keep going. This is a continuous swirl. And so this is one of the three motifs that we have in a class called Beginner Friendly Free Motion Quilting with Holly Ann Knight. And that class leads you through three different stitches and also kind of guides you on where to place them if you're gonna do more custom quilting. Today I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna do swirls. They're actually my favorite. It's just like doodling and it's kind of like your own fingerprint. So I'm gonna show you how we doodle on this with a swirl. I can't wait, okay. that's so awesome. All right, so let's set this aside and get this all sandwiched up and ready to go, right? Yeah. Yes. So there's a couple different ways to baste, and you can use whatever method works best for you. If you're a pin baster, there's curved safety pins that work really well. I know, Miss, you and I are I'm, both big fans of this yeah. free yeah, fuse. Yeah, it's Quilter Select Free Fuse, and yes. I especially love it on small projects like this. I think it's great for you know this great tabletop or wall hanging size. Mm -hmm. It holds everything together and I've tested it multiple times and had really great luck with it and I think you'll really like it. It's super easy to use mm -hmm. and so 
We also have some black batting yes. here. You want to talk about why we selected that? Yes. Yeah, so our batting also comes in darker colors. Right. And so the black batting um, we've used here because we have the black background. Yep. And so that way it just kind of doesn't have any shadowing or shading effects. And just in case some of the little fuzz might pop through because of the way I'm, I'm stitching really organically. That's right. Um, anything that pops through is going to be this little bit of It'll help it blend fuzz. in It'll with our design. In. I Absolutely. like that. And then we've used this uh, same beautiful print that we used in our drunkard's path. We're going to use this for the backing as well. And so remember, this is going to be larger than our top. Um, not quite as large as our batting, right? Right. And we're just going to sandwich this, this all together. So let's start. How do you, do you put your backing down first and then do the batting? How do you I do? I do. So okay. I would, I would lay out the backing and it's the biggest piece, right? So um, you can kind of center up everything else from there. From so there. this is a cut that's actually, for me, I just went ahead with the width of fabric. So it's quite a bit bigger yeah. one direction than it needs to be. And that's because we want to have enough to maneuver around and hold on to. So when you go to send something to a long armor, you have to have that four inches all the all way around. The way around yeah. It doesn't have to be four inches when you do it at home, but you want to have something to hold on to. Yeah, I, I learned that quickly when I did take the free motion quilting class. Um, that extra space to hold on to is, is really key yes. when you're working because when you're getting into the edge of your project, if you don't have that um, extra backing that's hanging over on the edge. You have nowhere to put your hand. I know, you have nothing to hold nothing on to. Nothing to hold on to, and you need it. Yeah. So, all right, so then now we have our batting piece. That's right. And then we have our top. Yes. And this is a quilt sandwich. It's a quilt sandwich, no mayonnaise necessary. Exactly. All right, and so should we move this over to the pressing mat and talk about the free fuse and how we yeah. find it? So we can do that and we can show a little bit and then you'll do the whole thing um, kind of the same way. You're going to center it up, peel it back a little bit, dust a little bit of the free fuse powder and then press it down. So also though, I want to say just like when we were doing the applique, you're kind of pressing it because you're, exactly. you're creating that glue um, stickiness. Yeah, it, this is, it's amazing. It, it looks almost like powdered sugar when you sprinkle yeah. it out. Um, and then as soon as it interacts with the heat of the iron, it turns to glue and it holds your layers together. So yep. it works great. So let's go ahead and take this over here. Okay. Let me press this up here. We have plenty of room. And then I'm going to start by folding back this Perfect. top corner so that we can see. And I'm going to bring this back around. There we go. All right. So we can see nicely on this black batting. Just a little bit goes a long way. And so I'm going to flip this back over. And I'm going to begin by just holding and pressing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have black batting, but you want to use a black background, that's perfectly fine. It is fine. This is just one extra layer of detail. One extra tip. And so then let's slide this over. Thanks, Liz. No problem. And then we can roll this side back. And we can sprinkle. And a lot of times people ask like, how do you avoid the puckers and things on the back? And so one of the, one of the ways, especially for a small project like this, is to be really generous basting. So a little sprinkle takes you a long way. If you're pinning, use a few more pins than you think you need. And um, if you're using spray base, which is also great, um, it is extremely cold right now. Mm. And so I don't love to do that indoors when it's cold because exactly. I don't get great ventilation. But um, if you've got good ventilation, you can do spray basting. And you're going to baste, while we've got all three layers together, Missy's basting the top to the batting, and then we're going to flip it. Exactly. And baste the backing to the batting. So that nothing's shifting on us when we actually take this to the machine. Yep. And you can see, I'm just kind of um, eyeballing. I'm trying not to get a lot of my um, free fuse beyond where my project actually is, because I don't want to get it on my iron. And if you do, you can just dust it off since it hasn't been heated up yet. Yep. And if it, if you do have an accent with it, there's iron cleaners that'll take it off too. Absolutely. No big deal. Slide this over so I can get this corner. 
And for me at home, um, the corners are usually the trickiest because you're kind of, as you're quilting, you're, you're going to be moving them in a couple of different directions, right? So making sure you get them nice and pressed down is like an extra tip for you. It's a being friend to yourself. So do you go back and add extra free fuse to the corner if you find well, you need I it? Would, I would check like this corner, I might put a little bit of A little bit more, on. okay. Yep. So let me get the body of this. Yep. Nice and basted. And then I'll check all my corners to make sure we're good to go. We'll just hold that on there to make sure. This is one of those times where you really do want to take your time. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's do this one last corner. Just get a little bit of extra powder in there. Now we can just flip this mm -hmm. and make sure the back is fused. I'm going to go ahead and press out that I was say, seam it's first. It's really common for a pucker to happen because you've got a fold in the fabric. And so that's exactly the, the first and best thing to do. It's just iron it all nice and flat. Yep, we don't want any of that. Okay. And so this does not have to be nearly as precise. No, it just needs to be stuck, right? Exactly. So you don't have to worry about the corners because you've got a nice big piece. So I'm just going to sprinkle this around and then fold this back. Come back and press. Mm -hmm. I love using this free fuse too because I find that if I do get up a rumple, it's really easy to lift it and reset it, reset it where yeah. I need it to go. See, I'm not doing a lot of pressing my iron around. Just enough once I know it's in place. Oh, mm -hmm. good, we're adhering nicely. Yep. Now we can slide this over and roll this back to where we stopped. Oops. Make sure we still have our pressing mat beneath us. There we go. Yep, that's important. You don't want to press this onto your cutting surface. No, you don't. It would be a sad day. Okay. There we go. I like to smooth it with my mm -hmm. hand first and then come back. And I start from the center press my way out. That tends to work the best for me on my backings. Yeah, absolutely. Kind little, of any wrinkles you do have will press out that Exactly. Way. It's a little different than how we approach the top because yep. we don't want to distort any of our piecing, but this is how I do the backing. Looks good. It is, it's laying so smooth. And so let's just make sure we get this last little edge nice and adhered. And then I think I need to come back down and do this bottom side. Okay. And then we're ready to go. Okay. Let's just turn this up. It's pretty close. It's pretty good. All right, we'll just add a little bit more down here and then I think we are We're in good shape. Ready. Yeah. Okay, so while you're finishing that then, what I've got set up on the machine I wanna show you is I'm using a free motion quilting foot, sometimes known as a darning foot. And it has this opening here and it is, um, there's another name for this as well, but it's, it's set up so that the spring kind of holds everything to the fabric as we are working. And I'm also gonna drop my feed dogs. So these here are your feed dogs. They move to help bring the fabric through. If I'm moving in a doodle fashion, I don't want the machine to take it straight forward. Exactly. So on this machine, I'm actually gonna pop this shelf off to take my feed dogs down. Here, let me your move machine, some of this stuff out of your way too. 
your machine will have in the instructions how to set it up for this. For me, there's a switch right here. And I'm just gonna pull that down. You saw the feed dogs drop down. So now my machine is ready. I've got the same um, thread in the bobbin as I do in the top, and that is because the way that stitching works, sometimes you're gonna see a little bit of the bottom stitch come in the top, the top or a little yeah. bit of the top stitch come through the bottom. So when they're the same thread, your eye just ignores it completely. Exactly. The last thing I'm gonna use is I use quilting gloves. And a lot of um, home uh, free motion quilters do. You can get these, we have these in a variety of sizes and a couple of different manufacturers make them. Um, if you're just dipping your toe in and you're not sure if this is gonna be for you, you can actually get some garden gloves. What oh, you need that's a good tip. is that they have these um, stickies at the end because yeah, rubbery that fingers. helps you to hold on to that and you're gonna not fight gravity. So I'm gonna pull these on. And I love these grabberies. They're, they're true to size um, and it doesn't matter which way you put them on, if the words are out or the words are in, they're stickies on oh, both sides. Oh, that is nice. So you're handy and ready to go. Left or right, it's good to go. Exactly. <laughs> and I go ahead and wear them on both hands. Okay. Um, you need to figure out what works for you. If you're finding that you need to have a hand free, you probably want your dominant hand to be free. For me, that would be right hand. But I like to have both hands loved and ready. So now this is all ready to go. And I'm going to slide this through underneath the foot. And I'm going to kind of guide it to make sure that the foot goes over. Sometimes it can get caught under here, mm. and that's a mess. So you just want to catch it so it's over. Now there's two schools of thought, too, on how to start. Some people start in the center and work out, and the bigger your project, the more likely that is to be the best thing for you. Okay. Smaller projects like this, I actually like to start on the edge because the edge and the corners are going to be more problematic for me, and I can work my way one side and kind of push any wrinkles I might have that way. Good tip. So I'm going to start right here in the middle, and then the last thing I'm going to show you before we get started is how to pull the bottom thread up. Okay. This was totally mysterious to me when I first started, but it's actually like really, really easy to do. So you take one stitch using the, using the hand wheel, all the way down and all the way up. Okay. Then you're gonna take this thread, and you pull it in front of your machine, and you're gonna slide it under and pull it to the back. That's all it is. And it's gonna pull the thread from the bottom up with it. Right there. Oh, I see it. You can yes. kind of see it wiggling through. And so you can use a pair of tweezers, but you're just going to kind of wiggle it up to the top. This is another place where the grippers are handy. So now the thread is to the top. Why we do that is because if you leave it on the bottom, it can get messy and nesty. Okay. So now that it's at the top, I actually know exactly where it is and I can kind of hold these two together. And make sure it's out of your way. Yep, and then I'm gonna put good. my needle back down where I started that. And you'll see that that's about a half inch away from the quilt top. It's a little harder to see because of the black batting and black fabric, but I started actually in the batting. Okay. So that way my first couple of messy stitches are not gonna show here. Or before you get into your project. So then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swirl onto here, and I have, I'm gonna go slow-ish. So I'm gonna start in this shape, and I am on just a straight stitch. Okay. And my stitch width and length aren't going to be determined because that's usually how the, determined by the um, feed dogs. Feed dogs. Okay. And so with those dropped, I'm actually in total control of how long these stitches are. The pressure. No, oh, the okay. fun. Okay, all right, all right. The fun. <laughs> I like okay. that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to doodle. Okay. So I'm actually going to doodle in the, in the batting for a second before I jump onto here. Okay. Okay, so like I said, we start with the needle down where we started. Is this something you do on paper to practice first? You absolutely can. And okay. Holly Ann talks about that being a really good way to get practice. One of the things, too, is you can actually put a pen here or pencil taped to here. Because the thing is, like, doodling gives you a little bit of the practice, but you're moving, instead of moving the pen, you're actually moving the paper. Oh, interesting. If you think about it. So yes. it's, it's kind of a little bit of a a trick for your brain to get used to. Okay. So that's why I like to start over here in the batting and, and get the hang of it, and then it just becomes kind of some muscle memory to go. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna move, and I'm just gonna make a little loop, and I'm gonna come back out, and that's a little swirl. Very 
Very good. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to be brave, I'm going to jump onto my fabric. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch that. I don't want to catch that. There we go. And I can make a loop. And you see I've got long stitches, I've got short stitches. And that's determined by how fast I move the fabric. Okay. And if you're not happy with it, chances are you actually need to speed up, which is counterintuitive, right? Because I was still talking about going nice and slow. And so when you say speed up, is that how fast you're pressing the pedal or how fast you're moving the fabric? It can be either one. That's okay. a great question. So one of the things is matching those two things. Okay. And the trick is actually to listen to some music or something with a rhythm. So when you have that, your body naturally moves. To that beat. Yeah. Okay. And so you can kind of hum a song to yourself. You can whistle. You can just put on your favorite music. You can listen to a podcast with a very nice voice. So many great tips. But you just want to kind of move. And what I'm doing is when I get to a point where my hands are uncomfortable, like here, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to stop with the needle down if I can. There we go, perfect. When a needle is down, then I can move around and not worry that it's gonna shift on me. Okay. So then I'm gonna move my hands and I'm gonna keep going. And the other thing is I'm gonna go both directions. So now I'm looping to the left. And I'm leaving a little bit of room in between. And I don't have to make a whole loop, I can make a little pointy thing as part of the swirl. And I'm using, I'm using kind of the edge of the foot to help guide me to keep these roughly even. Right. The other thing you'll notice is I don't care to stop when I hit the fabric that is part of our design. So as part of an all over, I'm treating this as one big piece of fabric okay. and doodling right over the top of it. I don't stop and care to make sure I stay in one fabric or another. When you do, that's more custom quilting and it looks beautiful, but this also is gonna look really nice. So now I'm gonna curve to the left again and I just make a hook. You see my needle's moving faster, but I'm getting away from my hands. So I'm gonna stop, okay. move my hands back in. And it's okay to stop several times. I'm now gonna hook to the right. And then come out. This is so therapeutic to watch. It is so fun to do. As soon as you just trust yourself, like this is a little loop. That's okay. It's a little loop. Yeah. You want to add another layer? Cool. You just hook back. Now it's a bigger loop. Love you can that. use that to move around to this next one and around to this next, next one. Some people prefer to sew towards themselves, like I am now. And you can do that too. Again, you place your hand. And you're gonna hook around. One other nice thing about this is I can move this around so the whole project can move. Okay. And I can then keep going. And because you've basted it so nicely, it's, it's not going anywhere. And I don't mind if it's in my lap. I go right over the top of this applique. And I'm gonna change my hands. But I'm gonna go right over the top of this applique. I'm just gonna go a little bit slower because I wanna make sure I get through all the layers of the heat and bond and all the layers of the applique that are on top of each other but there's not really anything different to that movement. So now I'm gonna come right over the top. I'm gonna get all kinds of layers here. And if your swirls look spiky, embrace that. Whatever your shape is, is your shape. So I want to see here, when we get a lot of layers, that'll happen every once in a while. Okay. I'm just going to trace back over that nice and slow. I was going a little faster at the end, trying to get fancy. We'll come 
back over the edge. And that part here, we'll be able to trim that out. Not a big deal. Okay. You, now we've stitched that down. And that'll happen. It's okay. not a big deal. Um, you just kind of keep going. And I think what I'll do is I'll keep going and then we'll meet you here at the end and kind of show you how to finish off the project. That sounds great. Okay. So now we're really close to the end. I just have this little bit of a loop to do. One more swirl. And then we're gonna go off the edge into the batting and I'll show you how we finish this off. Okay, great. And sometimes I kind of fake the swirls on the edge just so there's some stitching. So now I'm off the edge and now I can go ahead and lift the needle. There we go and lift the presser foot and I'm gonna pull this back a little bit. Uh -huh. And we can actually trim the threads out here. And then there's a trick that Holly Ann shows us to go in through the back and actually just use a hand needle to pop that back thread up here. That can matter, but since we're gonna trim. trim it off anyway, it's okay to leave it as well. Oh, okay. We just wanna make sure we go off the edge so that you're not gonna leave um, a string on the quilt itself. That makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to come in here. Is there any trick to make sure that you end up close to the edge at the end, or you just kind of do your best? That's a great question. So you, you can, like, if you end up the way that you're swirling and you end up stuck in the middle, you just want to take a few stitches in the same spot so okay. that it locks that thread, and that's okay too. But I tend to kind of work organically through the curves and then turn and keep going. Until so you I end up kind of in the corner. So we started over here on this side. Sure and then kind of worked back and forth. Until you ended up until here. Until you end up here. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm gonna show you just real quick what the back looks like. And with the thread being that pink, it blends right into that blends backing. beautifully, yeah. And so if you use that same, again, that same bobbin thread, you can see it in a couple spots, the way that it is because it is human done. Um, you're gonna see a little bit of sometimes the top thread on the back, sometimes the, the back thread on the top. I think it looks wonderful. But that's why you use the same thread in both the bobbin and in the spool. And that is your quilted project. I love it. I love that we've come this far. We've made it through week four. Yes. And so, so remember, if you're just joining us for the bloomering start to finish, you can go back and watch the previous episodes and make this wonderful project with us. And be sure and join us next Monday as we trim and bind. We hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you are not already part of the Missouri Star Quilt family, you can hit the subscribe button below so you won't miss a thing. And if you click that bell, it'll notify you every time a new tutorial comes out. See you next Friday.